Next guest is someone that I'm particularly proud of. I don't know if you guys know, but I really like New York and don't really like any other place. I don't know if you guys know that about me yet. Thank you, appreciate that. New York's the best place in the world. And one of the greatest startups that we have uh, in the past few years has been WeWork. And I know folks from San Francisco don't really get the whole idea of offline. They're just stuck right here on their phone. But this guy has turned um, a real estate business into an actual technology platform that is now worth more than $5 billion. Please welcome to the stage Adam Newman from WeWork and our moderator, Frederic Lardinois. All right. Nice hair. Oh, thank you. Yours also. Thank you. We coordinated. Uh, question, <laughs> question for the audience first. How many of you work out of a co-working space? How many of you work out of a WeWork? All right, you're preaching to the choir almost there. Yes. But Adam, um, I've talked to a lot of people who founded co-working spaces. Not all of them do very well necessarily. You guys raised 360 million, I think, in total so far. Your valuation is you're not really talking about it, but five billion or something around that number. Yeah, that's what was advertised. That's, that's pretty unusual. Um, how do you come up with the idea, of, how, how did you come up with this idea to do a co-working space and why is it growing so fast? So, you know, first of all, guys, thank you for having us and for all of you who have ever been to WeWork, thank you. Oh, Mike, Mike, it's not me, it's not my IT guy. Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me? Right. Hey guys, thank you all for having me here and is now I gonna? Oh, I really like yes. it. Okay. <laughs> That's what happens. You plan a lot and then it doesn't work. That's a startup. <laughs> um, you know, when Miguel and I co-founded WeWork, it was it before WeWork it started as Green Desk and that was in May 2008. It was my fourth business and Miguel's fifth business. And the one thing we really had in common, separate from the fact that we both grew up in a community-oriented uh, social environments, which we can speak about in a little bit, we both knew how hard it was to start a new business. And when you start a new business, you can spend 70% of your time on other things that's not uh, your business and not the core thing that you set out to do. And we were looking for a very simple solution. So in May of 2008, we convinced the landlord to give us a building. We had no money. We convinced him to give us a full building and we said we'll change the way people work by creating a few working stations, putting a receptionist. We opened it up, we put seven ads on Craigslist, within a week it was 92% full, immediately cash flow positive, and literally within a few weeks we realized that green is nice and co-working space is nice, but that's not a big business and that's not going to change the world. What we really were attracted to was community. And community is what makes WeWork different. And I think community is what makes the sharing economy different. And if you understand that you're part of a sharing economy and by leveraging community, you can become more successful as an individual or as a group, then you're part of the We Generation and you fit WeWork and all the other companies that are doing the same thing right now. You hinted that this is part of your, your background. You grew up in... So I actually grew up in a kibbutz. Uh, who here knows what a kibbutz is? Raise your hand. Well, wow, very educated crowd. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, a kibbutz is a failed social experiment that happened in Israel. <laughs> as a teenager and as a child, it was the most unbelievable place to grow up. I was with all my friends from morning till night. We ate in the same dining hall. We drove to the same school, and then we all did our homework together, or we didn't do our homework together. It was awesome. As adults, though, I remember looking at the kibbutz and saying, so in a kibbutz, everybody makes the same amount of money. So one of my friend's dads was the head of the factory. He worked 16 hours a day. Another friend's dad was the head of the gardening. He worked six hours a day. They both made the same amount of money. So even though for us as kids it was amazing, I always remember thinking that it's not fair that someone's effort is not getting rewarded based on what he puts in. And I've had a few discussions with Google about this. They sometimes call us kibbutz 2.0, but I think a little bit of a capitalistic kibbutz. So on the one hand, community. On the other hand, still, you, you eat what you kill and you get what it is that you did. And every person is allowed to have a different level of uh, desire and a different level of, uh, of where, what they want to put effort into whatever it is they're doing. Is that how you work with your co-founders? You eat what you kill? Is that what you're doing in the afternoons? Is that well, you know, we, we, all of our co-founders, something very nice about WeWork, every employee in WeWork has equity, including the porter, and uh, it's just a piece of what we are, so it's a very we thing. 
but some people are putting in more effort and some people are putting in less and you know it's sort of a balance and I think in general the world is going to be a better place if on the one hand we can be part of a greater thing but on the other hand we can still have our own admir our own desires and still go with our own path I was at your location in San Francisco your Golden Gate location uh, they had mimosas I think on Friday afternoon what time I think it was one o'clock or something like that. There was nobody left after by the time I got there. I think they were done at that <laughs> point. But it's, um, you, you were talking about fostering community. And it, it seems to work really well for you guys. At least I got that feeling when I was there. But how do you do that? So the one thing we learned about community and we always speak about, you can't force community. Community is an organic thing that has to grow. The only thing we forced was the name. We looked for a long time for a name that we thought incorporated community, and that's where we were came from. But everything else has been organic. We've given it five years. We've perfected how we throw events. We have a social app that connects everybody and puts them together and allows us to communicate to a large group of people and also lets our members communicate between themselves. And we have a group called community managers whose job is to foster community and make connections. And we actually bonus them based on how many connections they made a month and a year and it's a very important piece of, of their job. That doesn't sound that organic if you're giving bonuses for how, much, for how many connections people make. The, the organic piece is the fact that that's just connecting two people. That doesn't create community. The connections need to happen because a lot of times, a lot of people are very comfortable connecting virtually, physically. This connection is not always comfortable for everybody. And I think, uh, I think because of that, you need to help foster that a little bit. Once that happens, does that become a community? That's a whole different story. And the times when community is measured is actually times of trouble. It's hard to measure a community. If you're going to serve mimosas and everybody's going to come, that's easy. When Sandy hit and we only had a few buildings and our members were all helping each other and the ones who didn't have electricity were helping the ones who did, and a lot of stories that came from there, that was the first time we saw our community really alive. One thing I heard a lot when I was asking people about you is, you know, you're basically renting out. You're, you're renting space and you're renting it out again. Is, is the community part what makes you different from, from a Regis, you know, another office kind of renting company that they've got 2,000 locations or something? They're gigantic, right? But you guys are different from them. So, you know, the world is shifting. You have a generation that cherishes, cher cherishes intention and meaning a lot of times above material goods and you got to treat everything different the difference between us and a lot of other companies and we don't really look at competitors we really look inside and see how can we build a better product and a better company but the difference is when Miguel and I started this company it, the intention was can we change the world and if we taught other people to treat each other the way they want to be treated even if they did it just a little bit inside we work will that make a difference and we feel that all those things the more time is passing the more we let it happen uh, the bigger the difference is. So yes, community is definitely the difference, but I think the real difference, intention and meaning behind what we do. There's a real reason to why we chose to do what we're doing. And yet I do want to talk about the business side of what you're doing as well. Um, so we do, we do take large spaces and, and we do cut them up into smaller spaces. We have a design process that's all about creating collaboration. And again, it's not about forcing community, but creating those interactions. We use Beacon technology, but a lot of other aspects. We're using our video cameras to actually see where interactions are happening. We don't care who are the two people that are meeting. We just want to know that people are meeting. And then we change our designs in future locations based on that. And our entire process is built to sort of create that and make our members more successful. So you, you're actually tracking the community in a way? We're trying to track common spaces, how used they are. So if we create a game room, so a lot of places, when you go to a lot of residential buildings, they give you the tour and they show you the game room and then they show you the ping pong table, but no one ever uses them. We want to make sure that our spaces are actually used. So we're using just to understand how many, how many people are actually using it. All right. That, that's... And, we're, and we've learned a lot. There's a lot of things. We, we could tell you that Guitar Hero does a lot better than ping pong <laughs> after 6 o'clock if you had two beers. Or a Mimosa Friday. Or Mimosa Friday. I'm still surprised about the Mimosa Friday. 1 o'clock sounds a little early. I, I, there, was, there was tequila in, in Berkeley, I think, that day too. So that could that, be. That could be. It seemed like it was a good day. So our community manager actually has the freedom to do events, but a lot of the events are done by the members. So our members will do an event and call everybody else. Let's, let's talk about those members a little bit. You've got two different programs. You've got a, what you call the Commons membership for $45, which does not involve actually having a space. 
and then you've got different kinds of offices, different sized offices, right? What's, what's the deal with the, the one thing I didn't fully get was this commons membership. What's, what's the point? So I'll start with the easy one. You can be a physical member of WeWork from anywhere to a single person to our largest company has over 400 people. And you can pay anywhere from $600 a month to as much as $100,000 a month, depending what your needs are. There's also a lot of other services that we can give you. For $45 a month, you can become a Commons member of WeWork, which means you get the opportunity to enter once a month, you get a desk for a day anywhere in the world, and you get a one hour of conference room. But then on top of that, you can book any additional space, and you have access to the network, which means not only can you ask for an accountant or a lawyer or advice or anything you need from our other members, and our members are really good at giving quick answers to real questions, you also have access to our discounted services. So as a new Commons member that spends $45 a month, you could save up to $25,000 in the first year just on discounts between payment processing, healthcare, and storage space from Rackspace and from uh, Amazon Web Services. Payment processing is new, right? That's payment processing is new, yes. We haven't talked about it yet. That's the big announcement. How much can you say about that? We will, uh, with Chase's help, we will guarantee a lower price than anyone else in the country. Well, wow. and it's available to all of your it's, members? It's going to be available to all of the members. You can be a Commons member or a WeWork member. It will actually come out uh, in a few weeks. We'll have the full, uh, the full discussion about it. But uh, for anybody here listening today, we're going to give uh, one month of free Commons membership just so everybody can try and see if you guys like it with the full access to all the services and the community and see for yourself what you think about it. We're going to put it for one day. It's on the website if anybody wants it. So if I want to claim that, I just go to WeWork. Anybody wants to claim that, we'll go to WeWork.com. We'll be there for the day, get your month free, and see, see what it is that we're talking about. Is the, as a Commons member, I get access to the community, you say. This doesn't mean I get access to the, the app and, and the kind of LinkedIn. So as a Commons member, you get access to the app, which means you can post anything you want. If it's just you're looking for a good restaurant or if you're looking for a business colleague, but also you get access to the physical space. So it's based on availability, but we're now in uh, New York, London, San Francisco, Amsterdam, and about 10 other cities. And uh, by using the app, you're able to access any of them on one minute notice or 10 hour notice. And not only can you access when you land in London, you can also tell the community manager through the app, I need a lawyer, I'm looking for an accountant, I need to start a business in London, I'm looking for some advice. Do you see a lot of demand for the Commons membership? Or what's, so what's Commons membership is actually our fastest growing product. It's only three months old. Everything we do is in smaller numbers because we actually charge for everything. But uh, it's our fastest growing product. It represents about 10% of the community. And the Commons members use the app twice as much as the physical members. So they're a lot more active. Wow. We talked about this before when we were preparing for this. You, you mentioned that, that you, WeWork does a lot of tech as well. And people don't really see that. The, the Commons thing is part of that, but you do a lot more than that, right? So a lot of people might be surprised to know that we have more engineers in WeWork than contractors, architects, and designers. And we're not only, it's not even about being technology first. In today's world, when you build a company, if you're not technology oriented and you're not letting that lead your information process and your decision making process, then you're missing out. From the moment we choose a building, we've built our own system to choose buildings, because if you're going to take buildings globally, and we're going to have about 50 locations by the end of this year and maybe grow another 50 next year, you've got to do it in a very systematic way. So we've built a system to do that. We have a 3D system, a 3D modeling system that we use to design our buildings. And once we finish designing with them, that becomes the live 3D model that then runs the building. So if you're in our operation department, you can touch a screen and change a light bulb, because that will create the right ticket and what needs to happen from there. And then once you build those two things, the commons and the entire social network is where we bring everybody together, and that's obviously technology first. So in very, almost every aspect of our business. It's the next step then to have a little drone come out and... You know, we've every, many drone companies, and not only drones, but just different companies with remote control robots have been giving us, we've been using them for the past two years to try to deliver things to members or just to have video conference calls through them. We're testing, we're a great place to test new technologies. Something else people don't know, in the next five years, we're going to take over more than 50 million square feet. That means that for the Internet of Things and anybody who wants to create connected space, we're going to have more connected space than anybody else and we'll create it in a way that our members will be able to work with it and build into it and hack space, which we think is very exciting. I think I read somewhere that at this point you've got more space under management than the, the Empire State Building. Is that 
I am. Not right. I didn't read that. I'm not sure how big the Empire State Building is, <laughs> but we definitely have more space under management than the Empire State Building. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> It's right. big. When they go really tall, it's, it's confusing. They, they can get very big. But yeah, I think over 3 million square feet, and you're going to add another 5 million next year, you're, you're moving fast. That, that's moving very fast. How do you decide where you're going to go next? So that's a great question. So in the past three months, it's, it's become easier because through our Commons membership, we see virtual members that want we work to go to different places, and we just go to where we're very needed. But before that, we're looking at high IQ cities that have a, basically the we generation in them, and it's not limited only to tech, but it touches all aspects of startups and new businesses, and, uh, and we follow those cities. So for example, we just opened Austin two months ago. It's not the largest city in the US, but it's the right city for us. Chicago opened on Friday with tremendous success, and we're going to keep adding the right cities, both in the US and internationally. Do you say you're looking for the we generation? What, I am looking for the we what, generation. What does that mean? So a lot of people talk about millennials. I think that's limiting because it's only up to 35. Um, <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm borderline. So uh, I, I like to believe and we like to believe that anybody in the world who understands the sharing economy, who defines success as more than just financial, but also feeling good, treating other people well, and, and just being grateful, and understands that by leveraging the sharing economy, he, can, he or she can get space, cars, bikes, hotels, not only at a discounted rate, but through leveraging community at a much more social experience. And anybody who gets that is part of the we generation, and it's not limited by age. Do you see any differences, though, when you expand into... You've, you, you're in London now, you're in Amsterdam, um, Tel Aviv, and I think another location, Israel. You're, you're branching out pretty fast. What have you learned from you know, how people work differently in those locations? So uh, that's a great question. We, we added London, Amsterdam, and Tel Aviv only in one month separate from, the two, from the, those three. So it all happened very fast. And a few months ago, I got the pleasure to have a trip. There was a three-day trip, one day in New York, one day in London, and one day in Tel Aviv. And the most amazing thing that I saw in that trip as I was doing it is that the members might speak a different language and dress a little differently, but inside, they're all part of the sweet generation, they're all part of the awakening, and they, uh, they all feel the same. They're global citizens of the world. They wanna work to create their life's work. They, just want, they don't wanna just work to make a living, and they're willing to share and, and leverage their peers and the other members globally to become successful. And for me, it was very inspiring, and that's why I have a lot of faith in the future of, of our world, because I think with all of you guys and with all of us working together, we, we can change the world, and I think it's what we're here to do, and that's what's more it's important for us. So no differences? Main differences. Okay, language. Israelis, so we give free beer. I don't know that you guys know, but we give free beer in all of our buildings. We gave 90,000 glasses of beer last month, which is a number we're proud of. A, Israeli, naturally, if you give him free beer at, night, at 8 o'clock at night, he's going to call all his friends and say, hey, free beer, come. As opposed to that in New York and San Francisco, that's not exactly the case. In London, our beer didn't taste good enough. There's a lot of, there was a lot of demands about that. Coffee drinking culture varies tremendously. They don't have drip coffee. They don't drink drip coffee in London. We had to create espressos. In New York, they love the drip coffee. So a lot of small differences, but as a group, I think everyone here is a global citizen of the world, and there's a lot more in common than not in common between us and the rest of the world today. That beer thing works well when you move to Germany as well. I think. So we're actually, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put anything in front, but we are looking aggressively at Germany, at Berlin specifically. Which makes sense. Um, you, you said you've got 30 something locations right now. You're expanding to 50 this year. How do you keep, just personally, how do you keep up with a, a company that's growing that fast? So, you know, to anybody here who is now experiencing a fast growth, the beginning of growth, or it's going to come, the thing I've been learning about that is, first of all, it's people. And I know everybody tells you that it's all about people, but it's one thing to hear it and another thing to understand it. And the second thing, as a CEO and as a management team, you've got to rise on top. You cannot be making all the decisions and doing all the things, so you've got to get comfortable with letting go, which means some things will happen not the way you want them to, and mistakes will happen that you might have avoided. But that is the important thing when you're growing really fast, and, uh, and that's how we're doing it. We've also built an extremely scalable system, and because of all our technology product, we're able to do with four people what would take other companies 20 and 30. And you still have time to go out and hunt for your food. So and we still have time to go out and, and be part of this, yes. Uh, 
One question about the setup. Um, now that I've spent some time in, in your offices, all of the offices are pretty much open offices, right? And I've, I, there's not a day that goes by where I don't see something on Hacker News or somewhere where people complain about open offices. What's, what's your take on so that? So when you say open offices, you mean they're all built of glass? So all of the offices in WeWork are built of glass, so everything, everything is see-through, which is part of our transparent policy. You know, I'll tell you the truth. You hear a lot about this, but in WeWork, we've been very lucky. We, we do have a lot of security when it comes to hacking our infrastructure and system. But physically, we have had very, very few cases of anything go wrong. Mainly, it's another testimony to the community. Mainly because our community, if they see someone who doesn't belong or they feel something is off, will immediately either alert the person or, uh, or just go to wherever they need to go and, uh, and tell them about it. And uh, we've had very few cases out of hundreds, more than 100,000 people that have walked through the space. All right. Where do you see WeWork in five years? You know, in five years, I think you're going to see a 23-year-old or a 25-year-old, and you're going to ask them, hey, what do you do? And he or she'll say, well, I'm a graphic designer, and I'm a member of this awesome thing called WeWork, and I have offices, colleagues, and friends all around the globe, and I'm working for three months in LA and two months in New York and five months in, uh, in Tel Aviv, and then I'm taking a little time off because it's a month-to-month -month membership, and I'm going to use the money that I'm not spending to travel. And I think us really helping this global phenomenon becomes stronger and being a part of it. It's not about us being the only one or not about us being the biggest. It's just about being part of this movement, I think, is where I see we work and hopefully where I see us. All right. You didn't see I say IPO or something like that. I think that... No. <laughs> All right. It's a lot of people think an IPO, I get a lot of questions about that, is like an exit. An IPO is just another step in a company's uh, maturity. It's actually a very difficult step that needs to be considered very carefully. All right, we'll talk about that next time. Thank you. Thank you.